Hello and welcome to episode 223, my one year anniversary of hosting this podcast and a very special show I've got coming your way. Joining me today, Jared Yates Sexton, David K. Johnston, Dr. Michael Mann, Dr. Ruth ben Giat, Glenn Kirshner, Wajahad Ali, Barry Redholtz, Katie Fang, and John Avalon. I'm Pete Dominic. Time to stand up with me right now. Hello, my friends, and thank you very much for joining me today on Election Day. And I hope to see you tonight. I think I'll open it at 6.30, the Zoom Hangout for Election Night. Me and all of my favorite folks that are part of the stand-up community tonight, meet us in a Zoom Hangout. Get the password by simply subscribing to the stand-up community. Go to patreon.com slash Pete Dominic or the paid subscription link in the show notes. Hope to see you tonight. But for today, I put together a very informative and enlightening episode with nine guests who I went about nine, uh, about 10 minutes with each. So it's about an hour and a half or so in total where I reached out to several people asking them the question, what have we lost in the last four years and how, if any, how much, if, if any of it, can we get back? I tried to reach out to people from different backgrounds with different expertise. I decided on this idea early on Monday, well, late Monday morning, and I put it all together and called a whole bunch of people, and I, these are the folks that I was able to, to work into the show and schedule on the show. So it's not the perfect cross-sample and background and expertise, but these are nine brilliant people who are regulars on this podcast, and I'm so thankful to have them all. It has been a crazy year for me this past year when I ended my job at SiriusXM and began this podcast a year ago, November 2nd, I think it was. And I cannot have done it without your support. Over 700 subscribers have paid subscriptions to this podcast, and we need to do a lot better to keep sustaining it. I'm working as hard as I can to make this podcast happen every single day. Yesterday was a lot of work, but I'm psyched that I got these nine people to join me and have a conversation. Today is election day. There is so much to think about, but I didn't want to do an episode where we analyze and made predictions about what is to come, who's going to win, and all of that. You'll see that on live TV all day. I wanted to do something that would stand the test of time, something that would be enlightening and evergreen that you could listen to anytime and take stock of what we have lost. I know it's a morbid question. I know it's a sad question. I know this isn't the most uplifting episode of Stand Up, but the last uh, four years have been really challenging for so many reasons. And so I asked all of my guests what they thought we have lost and if we can get it back. I think it's really important to take stock of that so we know. So we recognize I was influenced by people like Tim Snyder and Masha Gessen and Sarah Kenzior and so many other experts on authoritarianism and trying to understand what it all meant and what we've lost. And so I think we did a really good job on this episode of the podcast. Thank you to all of my guests. Thank you for your support. I'm not going to say much more because it's a long show in terms of. Uh, nine guests, nine conversations, and I'm very, very excited that you're going to get to listen to them now. I learned so much, got so many very interesting perspectives, and I'm super happy to share it with you right now. Let me kick it off with a former federal prosecutor who has become a giant media star for his passion and his knowledge and his credibility on legal issues first at msnbc and now independently he's got his own youtube channel he's got his own podcast he's massive on twitter at glenn kirshner too ladies and gentlemen the former federal prosecutor 30 years prosecuting all types of federal crimes former army jag great guy love talking to him let's get it kicked off with glenn kirshner the kirshner report All right, so I could not do this special without the great Glenn Kirshner to talk about what we've lost over the last four years. You've been on it with your YouTube channel on MSNBC, on social media, everywhere you can be heard, and we're very we're better for it. So, Glenn, let's take our last kind of sad look back, but make sure I think that we we keep track of what we've lost. Where do you want to start? So I made a top three list. We could probably make a top three hundred and three list based on everything we've lost, but in my book. Maybe this is not a surprise because for 22 of my 30 years, I was a homicide prosecutor. So I worked with the families 
who had lost a loved one. So first and foremost, what we've lost is more than 230,000 people that we didn't have to lose. I mean, all along, I knew that Donald Trump had manslaughter liability. And then I heard what he told Bob Woodward in January and February about how deadly this was, about how easily trans transmitted it was, about how it's so much more aggressive than even the strongest strains of flu. And then that president went out and looked at us and lied to us and put us all in harm's way. And we lost more than 230,000 Americans when had we had he been straight with us, had we mitigated the damage, we might have lost, you know, uh, tens of thousands instead of hundreds of thousands. That is a sin that, you know, we must deal with beginning in January. More so than anything else, that's what we've lost. I think most importantly, the detail about that, if there was going to be a legal case, I'd like to understand it. There, there's this kind of neglect, didn't do anything, didn't admit to it, didn't trust the science. But then there's this kind of offensive thing that he also did was to foment the virus, to go and gather people against state laws inside and outside without masks, gathering people. And there's some research that says thousands and thousands of people definitely contracted COVID and hundreds at least had died. I, I mean, he's he's also on the offensive spreading the virus at his rallies and potentially to Secret Service members in a car. He's killing people to feed his ego and his ego is insatiable. And, you know, when he was just being grossly negligent and allowing the virus to spread, that's what we call negligent homicide or involuntary manslaughter. What he's doing now is actually depraved heart, second degree murder. Give me an opportunity to stand in front of a jury and argue this. I would do that for free. Uh, number two. So number two, I'm going to say we've lost uh, our sense of optimism that we have made more progress on the racial front than we've actually made. Um, and that is so disheartening. Um, I thought during the Obama years that um, and maybe this I, I thought we had come a lot further than we have actually come. It turns out that hate and prejudice was driven underground. It was driven into dark corners, but it was still there. And you know what, Pete? I think it was actually growing and festering. Yeah. And Donald Trump just gave people permission to let it all loose. Yeah. And that's so disheartening because I don't know how we work to improve race relations beginning in January, but I know we have to try to tackle it because now we know that all the Obama years did was tamp it down for a little bit and now it's exploded. So that's something else that I think we lost. One thing I think we can do is do everything we can to restore everybody's right to vote. That would be helpful. Uh, number three. So number three, I think we've lost our standing in the world. Mm. Now, I am not the kind of person who pretends that we have the right of moral superiority over every other country. I think we like to pretend we do. Uh, I think it's a little bit of faux superiority. Um, but whatever standing we had in the world, we've lost I'm confident we can get that back because I have folks who reach out from all over the world on Twitter and on YouTube, and they clearly are rooting for us. They clearly feel our pain with respect to what we're going through, being governed by a criminal administration. Um, but they have not given up on us. They keep saying, you all are going to turn a corner once Trump and company are out of power. So the world hasn't given up on us, but I feel like we've lost our standing in the world and we're going to have to work hard to become the good friends and allies that frankly we should be. That's a great, great list. And I really appreciate and respect the, the hell out of the way that you made, especially the loss of life being first. Uh, but let me just ask you about what you know best, which is your former employer, the Department of Justice. What have we lost there in terms of that institution, the public's respect for it, uh, as well as the people that are still there? And, and how do you regain trust in the Department of Justice? 
So I think there are two things. I mean, there. half of you America know. seems they're not half, but less than half that, that, that they're part of the deep state. I mean, starting there, yeah. that they're somehow. Well, I, th- I mean, I think that raises two questions. What have we actually lost and what is the public perception? Right. Sure. We have actually lost relatively little. I say that, Pete, because there are one hundred and fifteen thousand Department of Justice employees. I know hundreds and hundreds of them personally, and I can tell you what they have been doing for four years is burying their heads in their caseload. And they've been doing the hard work on behalf of the victims, on behalf of the American people. And the reason they haven't stood up and spoken out and either become whistleblowers or quit the Department of Justice is because then those cases that they are working would go, if not unattended, would be transferred to somebody else. And I can tell you, my caseload, when I was a federal prosecutor, nobody's going to put your hands on these cases or these victims or these members of the community. This is my job to make these victims whole, to make this injustice right. That's what the 100,000 plus DOJ employees are doing every day. So we haven't lost that much. What we have lost is the public's trust and confidence because their perception is that Bill Barr and the few piece of garbage lackeys that he has pulled into his orbit and seated in the U.S. attorney's offices, um, the people's perception is that's the Department of Justice. That's not the Department of Justice. That's the criminal cabal at the top. And those people are going to be run out on a rail by Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And then they're going to be held accountable. They're going to be investigated. They're going to be indicted. They're going to be tried, convicted and imprisoned. Pete, 14 government officials were indicted and imprisoned behind Watergate. And Watergate was a modest break in and a clumsy cover up. We need to put a thousand and fourteen corrupt politicians elected, appointed, and family members thereof, a thousand and fourteen need to be indicted, tried, convicted, and imprisoned. That's going to be our challenge come January. Where does that number come from? I just made it up. Oh, all right. Because if 14 were held accountable for Watergate, which was like shoplifting as compared right. to what Trump has done to us, right, right. then a thousand and fourteen need to go down for what they've done to America over the past four years. It's going to have to be a number somewhere around there. And what do you say to those people who, if uh, Joe Biden does win, want to do more damage during the lame duck session? I mean, what does Biden say? What would you tell? What, uh, shouldn't Biden say, hey, anybody who wants to uh, continue to take apart the government and destroy America, we're watching you? Yeah, during the lame duck session, I think, you know, listen, the president elect Joe Biden at that point, usually they take a back seat, right? They give the outgoing president their props and their space. I don't know that that is the path this time. I think Biden is going to have to think about moving pretty aggressively and saying, you know, listen, we're not going to let Donald Trump, for example, loot the U.S. Treasury and fly to a non-extraditable country, right. which typically sounds like I think I, I said, you know, we've gone from bad governance to like a bad Michael Bay movie at this point <laughs> within building a fence up. You know, yeah, we've yeah. all felt cornered in our lives, Pete, but we usually don't self corner. And this dude is at the White House self cornering. Yeah. Right. He ain't acting like a winner. So I think Biden is going to have to think long and hard about during the transition period, which is usually hands off for the president elect. What is he going to do? Because we all suspect Donald Trump is going to kick up a whole lot of dust. Well, one great thing that happened over the last four years is uh, me and so many other people got to meet you and know you. And I really appreciate uh, how often you've been on this program and our friendship. It's uh, it's been something I really cherish. So thank you for joining me tonight and throughout the past four years. And I look forward to talking to you a lot more in the next whatever happens. Right back at you, Pete. I appreciate your support and I appreciate you having me on. And frankly, giving me all the advice because as a government guy, I didn't know what the heck to do when I left government and you have been extremely all I said helpful. is just a little more cardio. I think a little more cardio is get you <laughs> where you want to be. Cardio. Cut down on the saturated fat. All right. Thank you, Glenn Kirshner. <laughs> all right, Pete. Glenn Kirshner, the Kirshner report. Follow him on Twitter right now. Glenn Kirshner too. also subscribe to his YouTube page, support him on Patreon and listen to his podcast. The guy's the king of all me. And I always love talking with him now. And it's just a really great guy. Please tweet him and tell him 
Thank you for joining me here on today's special. All right. Up next is a historian, commentator who's an expert on fascism, authoritarian leaders, propaganda, the threats these present to democracy. She's the author or editor of seven books, hundreds of op-eds, including that have appeared in places like CNN, New Yorker, Washington Post. She's a professor of history and Italian studies at NYU. That's New York University. She's got a new book. It's called Strong Men from Mussolini to the President out November 10th. Available now for pre-order. She's on Twitter at Ruth Ben Giat. And I'm so glad that I had her joining me for this special to talk about what we've lost in the last four years. Here's our conversation. All right. Well, now I'm very excited to have Dr. Ruth ben on the show because she is a historian who better to answer this question specifically uh, on the issues of fascism and authoritarianism. And and she's just written a great piece for Project Syndicate, basically answering in longer form, what damage has Trump done? Thank you for joining me. Ruth, how do you answer that question? How do you begin to answer that question? I know it's a long essay. I think we we're just beginning to fathom the extent of the damage, uh, both domestically, uh, his his kind of turning the GOP, this grand old party into a tool of his personal needs and desires and also what he's done to our foreign policy, almost making it for sale and with these uh, relationships with murderous despots and all the deals he's trying to do through the help of Kushner. So there's a lot that uh, there's a lot to process here. When we look at the damage that he's done to the trust in government, you've written a lot about that certain institutions and so on. What about that? How important is that? Yeah, again, he we we haven't even digested the the scope of what he's done to the federal bureaucracy. And, you know, sometimes that might seem like a boring topic, the civil service. But it's it's crucial because every uh, every authoritarian, you know, needs the bureaucracy to do uh, implement his sweeping agendas. And, and these are truly sweeping. So he's had a kind of passive purge as well, you know, making hospitals hostile workplace environment. So hundreds of thousands of people have left the Department of State, the EPA, and he's staffed it with uh, ideologues and lackeys. And so, you know, one of the principles is that loyalty rather than expertise becomes the criteria for service. And the more uh, people who are anti-science and anti-facts and into loyalty, and the more people who are um, okay with corruption, the lower the bar slowly becomes, which is perfect for a corrupt authoritarian at the head of the state. How hard is it to fix the first two when you look back at history? I am a ridiculously naive optimist, and I want to just say, well, he'll just replace Joe Biden if he wins those lackeys. He'll just uh, he'll, he'll, he'll rebuild the relationships overnight with foreign countries. How hard is it to fix the damage that's been done when you look at history? It, it can be, especially the domestic like civil service, it can take a long time uh, to you know, get rid of those people who are the bad elements. Obviously, it's it, you, whoever's in charge sets the tone. And so if Biden wins, Mike Pompeo, who's been a source of immense damage, Uh, to our foreign policy, you know, breaking all norms of uh, diplomatic behavior. He's also been an important uh, outreach to the evangelical Christian community, which, like uh, supporters of of old school dictators, proclaims that, you know, Trump is in office by divine mandate to save our country. Mm -hmm. So just replacing people like Pompeo or William Barr, a, a major, you know, number one, a a list villain mm. of this administration will set the tone for a different code of ethics, uh, a, a code of ethics to be restored to government service. Is there any way to measure, for example, the damage that has been done at state or at Department of Justice by Pompeo or by Barr? And we could name other agencies as well, especially the public health ones that have a lot more trust as a result of covid. Is there any way to measure that and look at it in terms of how they've changed personnel or or, or what it all means within those agencies and that damage? There, There have been some interesting articles about the Department of State, but 
I think with one of the one of the things that happens when you have people like Trump in power is that we're both um, exhausted by the pace of the news because they're creating constantly through their now it's their Twitter feeds. It used to be TV or newsreels, a sense of um, spectacle, a sense of exhaustion, a sense of scandal that is so vast that you don't really know where to start to tackle it all. So it's it's hard to take a step back. Um, some his, some journalists have done that um, and tried to look at the damage that's been done to the Department of State or to the Department of Justice. But a kind of sweeping that's that's an excellent uh, book to write uh, when this election is all over about what has happened to uh, our our civil servants and the tone of our political culture and our um, during this time, because the, the principle is that authoritarianism uh, only works if you're able to destroy the norms of accountability and transparency that are part of democracy. And once you do that and you get enough bad elements in the government um, there's a kind of process of corruption which, which happens. And this has happened to the GOP as well. And I write about these things in my book. I added a chapter on corruption to while I was doing the research to Good. cover these issues. Good. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm really excited about it. We're going to talk longer about the new book, hopefully next week. But just a couple more quick questions for you for today. Uh, what about the damage that has been done to the media and your new project syndicate piece you you defend against the accusation well it's not like he's he's shut down the media uh when you look at history and the way that certain fascists controlled the media and there was state media uh it's it's different but there's still been a tremendous damage done to the media just by the way that president trump has repeatedly talked about them and named them and labeled them how do you see the damage that's been done to mainstream journalism that was, you know, already had lost some respect and trust for other reasons? I think it, it's it's a it's a question that um, has in, on the positive side of the balance sheet. The Trump administration has seen the rebirth of investigative journalism. And the New York Times, the Washington Post are just the biggest outlets to hire many more investigative journalists who are doing heroic work to tracking this immense corruption of the Trump administration. So there has been a revitalization of some kinds of journalism. On the other side, uh, of course, journalists have been on the defensive and it's been some of the biggest outlets have been slow to reevaluate perhaps what it means to have a, such a partisan president who made it clear that he's not the president of all. He's only the president of some. And this desire to for the bedrock of journalist objectivity can lead, as we know, to a kind of both sides coverage, which when one side is mainstreaming extremism and inciting violence and, and mismanaging in a criminal way, a global health uh, scandal, you know, making it into a scandal, global health crisis. Uh, this both sides is not the way to go, in my humble opinion. Yeah. Well, I welcome your humble opinion every time. Last question. The damage has been done. And you read about this in your new piece in Project Syndicate to the Republican Party. Th this is one of the the saddest um, phenomenon of the, these four years, how the GOP has reduced itself to being a party whose functions are those of the, usually found in an authoritarian state where all of their time is spent smearing the leader's enemies and cleaning up his messes and professing loyalty. Um, Axios, the news outlet, recently came out with a loyalty index mm. to show how faithfully uh, most of the GOP has voted and and one thing I like to say here is that when we talk about uh, people who've made such an abrupt turn, like Lindsey Graham, right, who at the beginning was you know very uh, outspoken about Trump being a bad you know leader and and uh, corrupt, and then suddenly changed. So people say they speculate it's blackmail or whatever it could be. But in my research, I've found that 
sadly, there are people like Graham who had a degree of rectitude or very pro-military, would never have dreamed of backing someone who insults the military and prisoners of war. And sometimes for those people, it can be thrilling to serve someone for whom there's no bottom. All restraints are taken away. Um, it can be really liberating. And I think this is true for William Barr as well. So, so that's, that's one of the things that we've seen, that these people are energized by a leader who allows them to do things that were unthinkable in former administrations. So that's part of the story of the GOP. And there, the repair is to restore a sense of morality and uh, have the party come back to be uh, within kind of democratic political culture. And I'm not sure uh, that's what they want anymore. I so thank you for your time today. Really enlightening, important answers. The new book, Strong Men, Mussolini to the President, Dr. Ruth ben I hope we can talk all about that book very soon. Excited for it. Congratulations, and thank you very Dr. much. Dr. Ruth ben Giat. Get her new book, Strong Men, from Mussolini to the President. Pre-order right now. Follow her on Twitter. Let her know that you heard her on today's special. And let's move it right along. My next guest is one of my all-time favorites, a guy who I've become close to personally with uh, especially over the past year he has actually just finished his new book which he's going to be turned into his editor he is a, a really smart hilarious thoughtful brilliant guy who i love he's got a ted talk that's been seen by millions of people he's a contributing op-ed writer to the new york times a former contributor at cnn he's a lawyer he's a playwright and he is one of the smartest funniest best people i know and i had to ask him to join me on today's special he's on twitter at wajahat ali ladies and gentlemen here's my latest conversation with my friend waj he dominic how's it going man <laughs> why does it seem like you're in the twilight zone <laughs> It seems Nobody like you likes my pink lighting. Nobody. <laughs> Everybody has something to say about it, at least. Don't you I see th- the leaves in the background? I have a fall-esque in my shed studio. I thought it was uh, the comforting womb of a vagina for the second. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm going for, and only you got it. Wow. You, are, you and I really are soul brothers. Happy birthday. Thank you, sir. Happy birthday to you. How was it? It was good. I turned 45. You turned 40. I turned 40. I'm still alive. You're still alive. It's good. Yeah. So let's talk about what happened for you from 36 to 40 and for me from 41 to 45. This is a 10 minute segment with all my favorite people. So I'm so glad you could join me about what we've lost. I know you're going to be very optimistic uh, for me, of course. You know, uh, we lost so much of our bandwidth, our our time, uh, our investment that we could have devoted to learning how to play the guitar or learning another language or you know, learning how to garden or spending time with our children or reading books or combating climate change. I mean, if you really think about the bandwidth that Trump uh, has taken from us, right? And the, and the reason why he took the bandwidth from us and the, the reason why we let him is because he's a commander in chief. He was no longer this buffoon on late night you know, TV shows. So everyone said, ignore Trump. Yeah, you can. But at the same time, if you ignore him, you're ignoring the most powerful person on earth who has the ability to dismantle uh, this fragile thing called democracy and our rights. And the final thing I'll say is the reason why so many of us, we've talked about this on your show, couldn't sleep on it and still can't sleep on them is because it affects us, our families, our communities, our lives, our lives were at stake. So for many people, it's like, let's resist. And for us, it was like, yo, this is more about just political resistance. This is about our humanity. This is about the Muslim ban. This is about separating brown kids at the border. This is about, uh, unleashing the police and killing black people. This is literally about our lives. And so that's what he took from us, our time, our safety, our security. Um, But, you know, karma is going to be brown, black, white, gay, young, uh, and 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 karma is going to have the ovaries, the women folks. Uh, And I I predict I'm going to go ahead and make this bold prediction in the the few minutes that we have is this mother effort is going to go down big. I predict 350 plus. Uh, electoral sweep. I predict popular vote. I predict we take the Senate 52 48 wow. and we expand the house. I agree with your predictions. You I do. completely oh, that's agree great. with them. Yeah, I think it's going to be huge. And I think nobody wants to say it because they, they don't want to put their quote credibility on the line, but, that's uh, right. and they're so 
gun shy. I think actually I, I'll say something that makes uh, no sense and has no data. And I think people who have had a harder life and have built up more resilience and 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 don't necessarily love the idea of hope, they are they are protecting themselves by by right. predicting that Trump will win. A lot it's, of people who have yeah. had a lot of trauma, especially I think women. Uh, let's talk about them because they're not here and I'm an asshole, but I've been thinking about this a lot. And I think that it's like all the, all the horrible, you know, things that he represents and the Brett Kavanaugh and the womanizing and the idea that it, we're, we're so broken that we can't allow ourselves to feel. That's a, That's an astute observation. And not just uh, about women. I think, uh, I've said this before, but investing in hope is very dangerous because it means you, allow yourself to feel vulnerable and you allow yourself to experience disappointment and pain. And if you don't invest in hope, you, the, the alternative is cynicism and apathy, right? Which is terrible, but it's protection, right? Cause you can say, well, I knew it. I knew this country would betray me. I knew the majority would betray me. I knew after 63 million voted for this vulgarian buffoon, misogynist, hateful Cretan, of course they would do this because this is what this country is. So why will I allow myself to expose myself to the potential of so much pain and disappointment. It's better to wall up and be cynical. And I refuse to indulge in it. And I just did this tweet right before I came on your show. I literally said, it's okay to feel the trauma and, and the disappointment and the pain of 2016 and what we've endured. But I, I also ended this way. I said, it's okay to also be hopeful and passionate and excited to see so many Americans for the first time in my lifetime, be so invested in an election rallying to get this Haramzada, this Chutia out. And Chutia <laughs> I is think an those are curse words in Chutia your language. Chutia is an exquisite curse word. Uh, thank you, America. I've taught you a brilliant curse word of South Asia. I'll say it again. Chutia. What uh, language are we talking? Chutia is Urdu, Urdu. Hindi, Punjabi. Yeah, it's all of them. So in like, I'll give you an example. You're driving a car uh, in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, doesn't matter. And someone cuts you off. You just, you know, take your head out the window. Chutia! Yeah. Uh, and yeah. you, you know, you're, you're it's like, it's like, Hey, it's my friend, Pete. He's a Chutia. And you laugh, but Chutia <laughs> is also a fighting word. So it's all about context. I feel unsafe and I'm not sure why the <laughs> other, you know, what are the things that you think are permanently kind of gone at least generationally? I, I, yeah. I always think about climate and the planet, we could talk about reputation, the country's reputation. We could talk about institutions, and we can also talk about the courts. Do you look at certain things and say, listen, we're not going to be able to really gain back what we lost, maybe ever or maybe for a long time? Is there anything that comes to mind there? Every, everything you just said, I'm very concerned about, but I still feel if we have strong leadership, we can be bold and at the very least uh, maintain some semblance of normalcy, even on climate, even though we're behind, if we get aggressive leadership, there's still a small chance. The court, if you expand the courts or have reform, there's still a small chance. Voting rights, there's still a small chance. Uh, restoring trust and democracy is still a small chance. The one thing I will say that I think we have lost in our generation, meaning you and me, since we're old men, uh, what we won't see in our lifetime is I believe we have lost about 30 percent of this country to the disinformation swamp. Mm. I don't think we're ever getting them back. Mm. I think they're lost. I think they're radicalized. They live in, on Earth, too. They're not terrible people. One of the great villains of the 20th century and the 21st century is going to be the Murdochs. And unless we crack the right wing ecosystem and bring them down, I do not see how we get back about a third of this country that sincerely believes that you and me are part of a global conspiracy that traffics children and eats them with uh, salsa and achar at night. Wait, where are you on that, by the way? Uh, I am failed. I have not met my quota. <laughs> quota. Yeah. I can't believe you I'm were amazing. able to improv right into that perfectly. <laughs> God, that was amazing. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. But what you, I think the one word you met, you might have met, you said right wing ecosystem. Did you mean the right wing media ecosystem? Because I think of, of what we lost. A great point of in terms of what we lost to kind of the 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 crazy conspiracy folks. Uh, led by obviously the Murdochs, but of course it's on the internet, it's everywhere, it's online. Mm. And you think there's some way to to gain that back? Is it the media that you were referring to? No, I, I specifically said the right wing ecosystem. I used to say the right wing media ecosystem, but if we have to be honest, it's the entire ecosystem. Uh, QAnon, that was what I was referring to, which is a now domestic terror threat, a conspiracy theory, which everyone knows is nuts. Republicans have decided to go all in on it because the base likes it and it works for them. It's the entire ecosystem. It's top down. It's the think tanks, the commentators, talk radio, social media, the politicians. It's the entire ecosystem. 
that I believe is deeply connected, deeply incestuous, and we have lost it until we crack it. And the way to really crack that ecosystem, in my opinion, is to get a handle on the disinformation media ecosystem. And the first lobby of attack that I would do if I'm Biden and Harris, you can go after social media giants. You can at least take that peg out uh, because Mm -hmm. these guys thrive on Facebook, man. That's what people don't realize. Everyone's on Twitter and TikTok and Instagram, but Facebook is still king around the world. If you can find if you can get Facebook to crack down, you can diminish their power. The fact that they cracked down on QAnon, I think, was one of the biggest. And I don't know if there's any loopholes. If I'm missing, if they are, if they're able to get around, I heard they are still able to connect through Messenger and stuff. But you can't post a, a lot of the QAnon yeah. crazy shit. So I think that's a, a major, a major improvement by Facebook. But you're saying they need to go a lot further than that. Yeah, I think Warren's plan to go balls out. Break I mean, that's what, she wants to break. Yeah, if you and, and you threaten them, right? You probably won't break them up. But you, I, I want to like yeah. in the first month, I want a closed door meeting. With all the tech giants, because mm-hmm. remember Biden had uh, Trump had that meeting with the tech giants they, and yeah. they're all kissing up to him. Yeah. I want to close our meeting with Biden and Harris. I want Harris to come in there and say, listen, we're going to come after you and we're going to crack skulls. Step up or you're going to get cracked. And I guarantee you just the way D- D.C. works, how Zuckerberg works. I work with Facebook. They shift according to who's in power. When Obama was in power, they were all about, hey, let's w- work on diversity and inclusion and see how our, our social media can help empower communities as soon as trump got elected that budget went kaput um by the way i know you told me this in confidence but i i i gotta bring it up in public because i'm worried about you you said you're gonna get a bunch of brown muslims and stop a trump bus i don't think it's a good idea (laughs) i think it's a bad idea i think it works if you're white guys and you have trump flags but i'm i'm very worried about a bunch of brown muslims stopping a trump bus sir yeah, yeah, uh, we we will let the moderate whites take care of that one. I, I thought about it, I slept on it, and I'm like, you decided I said, against it. Yeah, I have the. Okay. I, call, I, I call the brown and the black Muslim Slack channel. I'm like, guys, my friend Pete, he's an expert on the whites. I have an insider. <laughs> he is really recommending against this, and I think he's an ally. And let, let's sleep on this one. Let's let's unleash the 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 Portland moms uh, on this one instead. Uh, I'm but, so yeah. glad you came to your senses. I really think that was not going to be good. Not gonna you're, be like, you're like, listen, man, you just made 40. I want to get you to 41. <laughs> God, can you imagine? It was the it was the most. Can you imagine uh, trying to prove a negative? Like I always I don't always love it, but it is always true. Imagine if they're Muslim. Imagine if they're black doing this kind of thing, raiding the Capitol with guns and all this. But everybody doing that on the stopping of the bus. Can you imagine if I it was a imagine. bunch of blacks or Muslims? I, I, you and me have a fertile imagination. I, it'd be like Mad Max. All of a sudden, there'd be a tank, and they would just literally take us off the road. And you're like, you just be watching Mad Max on your iPhone. Hey, did you, like, did, just, did you, here's a SWAT team that has just blown up a a, 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 a Honda Odyssey. <laughs> <laughs> Any chance you followed real quick the uh, the the lawn yard war in my neighborhood? I'm, I'm very I'm very proud of you. I, I've been oh, you encouraging are? you. I feel like I'm out. I feel like I've been beaten. The neighbor, uh, yeah. you saw the latest of the neighbor put up the Trump saved America facing at oh. my house. I'm out, Waj. I'm out. But you know what? You get the uh, victory uh, tomorrow night. On Wednesday morning, you come in, just plant that flag and just stare there and just, just piss on it. Piss on the flag with well, victory. I I, uh, <laughs> I don't think I am. I think I'm going to take advice. Somebody said on social media, you know what you should do after the election? Take your, your Biden sign out and put in a peace sign. What do you think of that? Well, that's, that's uh, actually in all seriousness. You like that? Uh, I was having a very quick, uh, very quickly. I was having a conversation with someone. I know a lot of people want vengeance and hopefully the people who committed crimes, there will be a, a healthy accounting and there'll be a reckoning, yeah. but we need to rebuild a coalition and a center. And there has to be some opening for people who made the mistake of voting for Trump to see the light. And I, there, that always requires us being the better person. I know it sucks, but People of color oftentimes have always been uh, welcoming when we're not welcomed. So if you do put a peace sign, I think that you will be reflecting the better values of, of yeah. being a better American. A peace sign, I'm going to give them a pie with bleach in it just so that they yeah. don't get. <laughs> yeah, no, but the give them a, a, that if they have coronavirus, they'll, uh, you'll save them. That's exactly what my aim is. I just want to help people. Thank you very much for talking to me. I love you the greatest. All right, All right man. Good luck tomorrow. Let's vote. Yeah. Peace. 
There he goes. I love him. At Wajahat Ali, W-A-J-A-H-A-T-A-L-I on Twitter, where he's great. I can't wait to read his new book. And he's uh, I'm so, so psyched that he was able to join me on today's special. Give him a follow. Say hello on Twitter if you haven't already. Thank him for joining the program. Okay, move it along. And this, by the way, in case you're wondering, is the value that you get if you're a subscriber. I know all these people. I know them well. I have great relationships with them. I can get them to join me on a moment's notice. I literally booked all of these people starting yesterday morning. Had great conversations with them. And that is worth something. So I hope that you'll consider subscribing for as little as $5. I hope that you will join us on election night. By the way, I forgot to mention that at the top. Maybe I'll have to go back and edit that in. Election night Zoom. Check in the post for today's show if you are a subscriber at patreon.com slash Pete Dominic, and you'll get the link. I think we'll start a little bit before 7 o'clock. Let's say 6.30. I'll open it up, and that's when we will join and hang out and talk and watch the returns coming in and maybe record a little bit for the next day's episode. All right, moving on. Now I'm excited to welcome to our conversation a woman I got to know through our time working together at MSNBC on various different TV shows and panels there. She's a legal contributor there and NBC News. She's a trial lawyer. She's got her own practice, Katie S. Fang. Uh, Her website, katiefang.com, and she's awesome on Twitter, at katiefang. I was really happy that she was available, and I got to connect with her while she's down in South Florida, where she lives with her husband and her six-year-old daughter. Here is our latest conversation right now for the special. All right, I could not do this special without Katie Fang, so I'm so glad that you were available to talk about this this question to look back, because I think it's really important, right, to just take a toll for what damage this president has done. Katie, where... I, I'm trying not to be too specific with people. Where do you start? This is like the worst time capsule question you could ever ask me to do, Pete Dominic. I mean, oh, what a heavy question. Like, what a heavy consideration, right? Yeah. Where to start? Where to start? Because it never really ended, right? If you think about it, it's, we always talked about turning the corner. We always talked about maybe it would get better. We've been doing it for four years. So now we're on the cusp of, you know, and I always used to blame people. I used to roll my eyes about oh, such melodrama about this existential crisis that we're facing as a result of this presidency. And yet you can't roll your eyes anymore and you can't pretend like it hasn't become a life or death um, situation. And for those of you out there that would disagree, then you really don't care enough. You really just don't care enough about what it means. And I think everything Pete's situational. So putting aside me being a lawyer, Putting aside my age, I'm 45 years old. I've been on this earth for a little while. Me too. Um, Okay, see, there you go. So we've both been on the planet for a little while. We've both seen and experienced a lot. But, you know, you always have to look situationally in terms of where people come from. And I do that in my job. I do that with clients. One of the first things I always ask a client is, well, what do you want? Like, what do you want? Because then I can figure out how to get you there within reason. Um, Ethics, which don't really exist in this administration and in this Department of Justice. Um, you know, rules of professional conduct govern me as well. Clearly don't apply in this administration or in this Department of Justice either. But I guess my point is, Pete, we always kind of look through life through a lens of who we are and what we've been through and where we're going. And I always look at it now these days from the fact that I have a six-year-old daughter. I also look at the fact that I've had loss on many levels, most recently with my dad passing away last year. And I still have my wonderful mom, but I look through the lens of, oh my God, I have a six-year-old who I need to leave this earth, you know, to whom I will leave this earth in in a while. And what is it going to look like? And even though Donald Trump will be gone tomorrow, ostensibly, and um, the worst, worst case scenario is he has a second term and then he's done. I I, I fear about the long-term damage from our judicial system standpoint, because there was a time Um, Prior to this administration, that you heard something about truth and justice, you thought about courtrooms as being battlegrounds for justice. You thought about laws governing all of us, regardless of our skin color, our gender, creed, uh, religion, nationality. Laws applied uniformly and without prejudice, allegedly, um, to us, even though, of course, there have been laws across the years that have been 
overtly prejudicial right. and overtly cruel to certain people. But it doesn't make a difference anymore, right? Because we used to say, okay, let's go fix it by going to court. And you'd go to court and people would obey the rules and they would live by the rulings. But we've seen now time and time again with Trump and this administration, he just doesn't give a shit. He'll get a ruling. He'll figure out a way to appeal it. Um, again, not going to begrudge you if that's your appellate remedy available to you, right. but you're supposed to do it in good faith. So I guess, Pete, to answer your question, what do I think has been the toll not only on us as humans and as us as lawyers and as, as you know, um, members of the planet Earth? Good faith is gone. Mm. Whatever that meant, whatever that meant to you, Pete, whatever that meant to your, you know, you know, people in your neighborhood that don't understand the concept of, of not putting crappy signs on their lawn. <laughs> Whatever good faith meant to you and to me, it's gone because there was a time when good faith meant, um, and, and not for any specific gender reason, but a gentleman's handshake meant something, right? You did something in good faith and that kind of guided who you were and that doesn't exist anymore. And so now when we do things and when we kind of gird ourselves for battle, we have to do so assuming that there will be bad faith on the other side. We've seen that in politics as well, right? It's not just in the legal you know, battles. We've seen them in, in the Senate. We've seen it with the most recent Amy Coney Barrett nomination process, right? right? Um, and so I feel like that's been the pervasive problem. There is no good faith left. And, and, and I think that that's what we need to find again. And I don't know how we're going to crawl out of that whole if Donald Trump wins again tomorrow. We'll still fight, you and I, and the others that are our friends and our loved ones will still fight. But it's hard. It's a really kind of tough place to be. It absolutely is. And I think that's so honest and well said. When you make that uh, point about good faith, I mean, do you think that that waters down into your work, into your community, and that people uh, just are are polluted by this president's attitude and everything that he wrought? And I mean, how much can can actually be blamed on him anyway? We were probably headed in that direction, although I feel like, Katie, so much can be blamed on him and just the way that he handles himself and how anybody can just be OK with it. I always think about Obama and how great a guy he was, almost perfect in terms of his personality and the way that he treated himself and carried himself. This guy's, of course, the exact opposite on his third wife who hates him. Well, here's the thing. I'll give you a perfect example. We unfortunately had Donald Trump do one of his super spreader rallies here in Miami last night, just last night. It's maybe like a 48, 49 minute rally, which oh, wow. you know people are saying are indicative of him losing steam and not having the momentum. But, you know, he brings a super spreader, spreader rally to my backyard. But the reason why I bring this as an example to you, Pete, is the following. Then this is a good faith example. There's a curfew that we have here. He started at 1130, allegedly, which I don't think he even started at 1130, but our curfew is midnight, hmm. right? Do you want to exercise your First Amendment right for expression to be able to do the campaigns as a candidate? Feel free. Why don't you do it being mindful and respectful and in good faith because there's laws and there's rules and there's ordinances. So when you do stuff like that and people violate curfews or they don't wear a mask, I mean, it really is. He is the exceptional example of the fish rots from the head down, hmm. right? And I think that is why you find this level of just I don't give a shit in this is what I call it with the blocking of the roads that we just saw yesterday right. and in other you know, places across the country. It's the I don't care if there's an emergency and a vehicle needs to get through. I don't care if you just want to be able to go to the grocery store to get groceries for the week. It's the I don't give a shit in this that now applies to people that are Trump supporters um, and several members of our GOP, if not all of them. And, you know, and, and I look at the watered down and it's disappointing as a woman. It's so hard hard to get women in positions of political power to be senators and to be representatives, to go to the House and Congress, et cetera. And I look like people at Susan Collins, for example. I mean, I look at people that are supposed to have a voice that a lot of us don't have to affect change and to make to make laws and to do the right thing. And they just don't give a shit. Right. And so I don't know if it's apathy that's now inspired by cruelty. So that's why you just don't operate in good faith anymore. I don't know if people are always like this and they were just waiting for somebody to give them the ability to enable them to be right, this way. Right. I don't care what the excuse is because it's an excuse. 
So as far as I'm concerned, it's how do we turn that corner? And I have never been a revolutionary. I have never been a broad burning feminist. I have always told you time and time again, Pete, that I have never been the person to like literally go out and march in the street. And yet, how are you not inspired to do so to affect the change that you want it to be? You have, how can you not now? And, and I try very hard to be mindful about um, COVID and, and how to not have overexposure, et cetera. But, you know, you have to be there. I, I, I got a uh, mail-in ballot and I refused to put it in the mail. I so I went didn't trust and it. I voted in person because I didn't trust the process right. anymore. So I guess that's the, the disappointing kind of byproduct of this whole thing for us now is what, what institution can you trust in anymore? The damage to institutions is something that I, I, I hear talked about all the time, and it, it, it's hard to kind of make uh, sexy and get ratings on and talk about. But it, it seems to be one of the most important issues is the damage to institutions. Do you want to pick one before we wrap and, and tell me what you think has been done to either the legal canon in general or the Department of Justice or appellate courts, whatever? Say, listen, a lot of us don't interface with the Department of Justice in our lifetime, right? Number one, it's usually not anything that we deal with. Most of us deal with what traffic tickets at, at the most. Right. Some people actually have more exposure to the civil and the criminal judicial system. But just the damage to the institution of the concept of just justice in whatever capacity that is, um, it, it's it's the chip, chip, chipping away. Sometimes you don't even see it happening. And then you look back now on four years and what do we have as a result thereof? We have an attorney general who is not the attorney general of the United States, who I've said time and time again is the personal attorney for Donald Trump, who went outside a couple of days ago to protesters, Trump supporting protesters that were protesting in Bill Barr's front yard because he wasn't prosecuting or he wasn't going after the Bidens enough came out, he shook their hands and then he said, thank you. And Lord knows what he reassured them he was going to be doing. I mean, it's, you don't have trust in that system anymore and there's no institutional trust. And I think that that's the most long-term, most damaging thing we have, because again, I don't care what your politics are. You always thought that the legal system was going to provide recourse for you. Right. You always thought I could go to court and I can have my day in court and I can find justice, however that's defined. But now justice is completely skewed depending upon who you are. Right. And I think that that's the hardest pill and the most bitter pill to swallow after the last four years. So that's been part of my reason why I've wanted to vote for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, why I wanted to get Trump out of office. Because if there's anything that we ever need to grasp upon, especially in the midst of a pandemic, it's something like a like a like a lifesaver, right? Like something to hold on to, yep. to just kind of give you continuing hope. Yep. And that's always the idea that there was going to be um, win, lose or draw. We could go and we could find some type of recourse in a legal system. But who the hell knows what's going to happen now? What if he says, screw it, I'm not leaving the White House. He's barricading himself in now, right? What if he says, screw it? I didn't really lose. It was all fraud. All you states out there that are allowing ballots to come in after Tuesday and after the deadline, that's all fraud. I'm not leaving. So now we're going to have another battle in, in the court system. And we've seen through the impeachment process um, what the lawyers that are fighting for Trump are like. And so it's just been one disappointment after another. But you know what? We'll pick ourselves up and we'll dust ourselves off. But I'm a true believer in the right being done. And I'm a true believer that we're going to have the right result with Joe Biden being our next president. So I hope you're right. And I really appreciate everything that you just said. I've so enjoyed getting to know you through this nightmare and getting to speak with you. And I look forward to talking to you again in the after times, as I'm calling Absolutely. them. Absolutely. Thank you, Katie Fang. Always. All right. There goes Katie Fang, katiefang.com, at Katie Fang. Love talking to her. She was awesome, as always. And you should follow her on Twitter and check out her website. And she's, uh, she's really great to have joined me as well. Really enjoyed that conversation. Look forward to talking to her a lot more in the coming year. And now it's time to move on to my next guest. I wanted to make sure that we got somebody that could talk about what we've lost in terms of the planet, in terms of climate change. So my top my top guy to talk to this was available, to talk about this was available. Very excited that he was able to join me. He is, of course, one of the most respected climate scientists in the country. 
He's a scientist. He's an author. He's a distinguished professor of atmospheric science and director of the Earth System Science Center at Penn State University. He's got a new book coming out in January. It's called The Fight to Take Back Our Planet, The New Climate War. At Michael E. Mann to ends on Twitter. Dr. Michael Mann joins me now. All right, there he is, Dr. Michael Mann at Penn State. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. You were you were my top guest for this this show special because I wanted to talk about the question that you know the answer to as well as anybody being a climate scientist. How much have we lost in the last four years on the fight to save or fight the climate crisis? Yeah, well, thanks, Pete. It's good to, to see you. Good yeah. to be talking with you, my friend. So, you know, this is perhaps the greatest crisis we face. I mean, we will sure. get past the pandemic, but still looming in the background will be an even greater, arguably existential uh, crisis, the climate crisis. And unfortunately, four years of Trump has already uh, set us way back. Um, four years ago, the United States was a, in a leadership position on climate. Uh, we were forming alliances with other major emitters like China that paved uh, the ground that created the opportunity for the Paris Agreement, which was a monumental achievement, sort of started to get us on the path that we needed to get on to avert catastrophic warming. And then along came Trump. Um, and within four years, he has dismantled much of the progress that we had made under the previous administration. Um, he has undermined uh, the EPA's efforts to 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 you know incentivize the decarbonization of our economy. He's gone back on the fuel efficiency standards that had been set uh, under the Obama administration. Yeah. Um, gutted you know the clean air act the clean water act um and undermined the the clean power plan which was a major uh, piece of uh, policy progress under obama that was going to help us decarbonize our uh you know our our power sector and unfortunately he has even gone back on the paris accord uh, making the united states under trump the only country to literally withdraw uh from from paris and Let's make no mistake. Um, the Paris Agreement was a monumental achievement four years ago, and it was where we were four years ago. But we're further down the road and we still haven't gotten the reductions that we need. So we need to go well beyond Paris now. We need to ratchet up our commitments and the, the rest of the world has to if we are going to keep carbon emissions low enough to avert catastrophic warming. But, Michael, if Joe Biden wins, can't he just get us right back in Paris and then uh, reverse all of the things that Obama did? I mean, that Trump did? Well, you know, uh, reversing our stance on Paris is, you know, the, the, the least of our worries right now, because simply saying we're still in the Paris Agreement again four years ago, that's great. Now we need to be far beyond Paris. We need to be making greater reductions than we committed to um, under the Paris Agreement. Moreover, by sort of, um, you know, unilaterally withdrawing from the Paris Agreement, we set we sort of sent a message to other major emitters, most notably China, the, the world's largest emitter of carbon now, that we're not serious about our obligations that sort of created an opportunity for them to sort of go back on, on some of their commitments. And now we've seen in this four year period, uh, China, after having uh, been on uh, a, a path where they were decommissioning coal fired power plants and they were going well beyond the commitments that they had made under the bilateral agreement with the U S under Obama and under Paris, they were ahead of their uh, commitments and now they're building coal fired power plants once again, because, you know, if, if we're not serious, if the other of the two world's largest emitters, the United States isn't serious, then why should China be serious? Now let's make no mistake. They're still doing much more than we are. And the fact that uh, China is still making progress and the rest of the world is still making progress means that it's not too late. Even here in the U S we've actually made some progress. We'll come close to meeting our Paris obligations, even without Trump supporting Paris primarily because of what states are doing, states like California, the New England states, the Northeastern states, uh, the West Coast states, um, cities and municipalities, companies uh, who are all still right, in Paris. Right. 
So, yeah, so we we will come close to meeting our Paris obligations. And that's the good news. The bad news is we've got to go far beyond that. And that's why we can't possibly afford another four years of Trump. It's why I've called another four years of Trump game over for the climate. There's just if you do the math, it just doesn't work Four more four more years of Trump. And we can't get there. Because as I've always understood and reading you and, and, and talking with you and your colleagues about the science, a lot of the damage that is done to the atmosphere, to the planet, uh, it, it is we feel it long after it's done. So what we've lost is time. We're going to see the effects of the pollution, of the lack of efforts over the past four years, in the next four years, in the next 10 years, in our lifetimes. We're going to see that. We're behind. We've been behind. How far behind are we? Is there any way, Michael, for you to frame it or quantify it for a way that those of us who don't understand science and math very well can understand? Yeah, well, you know, um, and and I think some 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 of you who claim to not understand it actually understand it pretty well based on my conversations. But, uh, you know, but again, yeah, the you know, for the public at large who, um, you know, are not up on the numbers, they're not up on the latest science. It can be very overwhelming. It can be very confusing, especially because there have been some important developments in the science. One of those developments is actually sort of a positive one in the sense that uh, as we uh, do sort of more sophisticated modeling experiments, um, in particular, where we treat carbon dioxide as a more dynamic variable, because you know we burn fossil fuels, we put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And in the climate modeling experiments we used to do, we treated the carbon dioxide as if it was just a simple control knob. And we just turn it up in the model and we see how the model responds. But that's not the way it works. We don't have our hands on the dial. What we are doing is adding carbon to the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels. But the climate system, the oceans, the biosphere, um, life on Earth, plants um, actually absorb some of that CO2. And so it's the climate system itself that determines what happens to that carbon dioxide once we put it into the atmosphere. And one of the things we now understand is if we stop burning carbon cold turkey, we do it right now then CO2 in the atmosphere starts to drop. It starts to drop because the oceans are still absorbing that CO2 in the atmosphere, and we've stopped adding to it. So it's sort of like a bathtub. You had the faucet on, the water level was rising. You turn the faucet off, um, the drain is open, that water level will go down. And that's sort of the way it is with the CO2 in the atmosphere. So we have two sort of competing effects There's the fact that you alluded to that once you warm sort of the the oceans, they continue to warm up for decades just from the CO2 that's already there because of the sluggishness, what we call the thermal inertia. But offsetting that is the fact that the CO2 in the atmosphere is actually starting to drop. Those two things end up largely canceling. And here's the bottom line. Global surface temperatures on the planet stabilize within a few years. If we stop burning carbon right now, global surface temperatures stop increasing in a few years. That's the good news. The bad news is the deep ocean is continuing to warm. The ice shelves continue to erode. We could still see the collapse of the ice sheets. Um, We could still see other downstream effects. But we can stop the warming of the surface of the planet if we act right now. And that's the good news. It means that while there's urgency... There's agency. Our actions make an immediate difference here. Do you see any way forward that we'll be able to do that here in the U.S., much less with the rest of the world in terms of policies, in terms of laws? Yeah, you know, um, what what we've seen from the Biden campaign, uh, from congressional Democrats, House Democrats and Senate Democrats, each of them has their own climate plan and they're all bold climate plans. Mm. So we have the luxury of having several different climate plans on the table, ready to become policy if we take back our government. If we turn out over the next 24 hours, uh, if we turn out in droves, um, if we win back the Senate, we keep the House and we get the presidency, then we could have a climate bill. In fact, I would wanna see that as part of the first 100 days of this administration. The the first 100 days agenda should have Foremost, um, the 
passage of a comprehensive climate bill. And if we have a Democratic Congress and if uh, Senate Democrats decide to do away with the single greatest enemy to climate action, which the is filibuster. the filibuster. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. We can make it happen. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad that you said that and you framed it that way because it is exactly true. The single greatest uh, threat to the planet is the United States, United States Senate. Filibuster we had a Democratic right. president and a Democratic Congress, yep. and we couldn't get a climate plan through because of the filibuster. History matters, and so does science, and that's why I'm glad that you were available to me for this special. I hate to cut it off. I can talk to you forever, but thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Michael Mann. So appreciate it. Thank you, Pete, for all you're doing. All right, Dr. Michael Mann. He's on Twitter at Michael E. Mann. Check out his new book out in January. It's called The Fight to Take Back Our Planet, The New Climate War, out January 12th. Michael Mann, awesome that he was available. Really psyched to get him on. All right, now another one of my all-time favorites. So happy that I have access to all these folks, that they took my call, that they allowed me to record my call and share it with you. David K. Johnston, ladies and gentlemen, is a... One of the most respected investigative journalists of his generation of American journalism period. He's an author. He's a specialist in economics and tax issues. He won the Pulitzer Prize for beat reporting back in 2001. He's written so many very important books, and he's got a new one coming out next year as well. And you got to check out his nonprofit reporting at dcreport.org, where they have a very important four-part series that just dropped today about President Trump and his taxes. And uh, I highly recommend you look into that. dcreport.org. On Twitter, at David C. A. Y J David C A Y J my conversation with David K Johnston. All right, well I couldn't do this special without David K Johnston because nobody knows Donald Trump and his crimes better than David K Johnston, and he joins me right now. I've told everybody all of the plugs, everything raved about you already in the, in the introduction. Thank you for joining me, sir. Well, thank you, and uh, thank you for wearing a T-shirt, an O'Neill T-shirt from my home in Santa Cruz. California. Jack O'Neill was a, a great guy, a great surfer. I was a terrible surfer. Terrible. It's a legendary brand. And a, what a coincidence yeah. that I happen to be wearing it, of course. But you know a little bit about just about everything. And it's going to be way too hard to keep it to 10 minutes in a conversation with you about in the last four years, what have we lost? So sadly, many of the predictions that you made based on your reporting have come true. But Help us understand what we've lost, and if you want to talk about how we can get it back. Where do we start, sir? Well, the most important thing we've lost is dignity. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, we had 44 presidents in a row, some of them smart, some of them dumb, some of them good guys, some of them bad guys, but every one of them tried to make the country better. Even Chester Arthur, who was a Tammany Hall crook and became president when James Garfield was the second American president assassinated. He brought us good government through the Pendleton Civil Service Act. But Donald Trump is different than the rest of them because he's not about America. He's about Donald. And he didn't fulfill his promises, you know, infrastructure. If he had come in the very first day and said, we're going to do a massive infrastructure program, the Democrats would have rolled right over on that. And today, you know, the only people who'd be suffering are those who own front end alignment shops and sell tires when your tires get broken because of potholes. <laughs> The rest of us would all be much happier. He didn't do it. He didn't build the wall, much less have Mexico pay for it, because it was all a con job. The second thing that we've lost is respect around the world. During Trump's administration, I went to uh, every other continent except Antarctica. And, uh, you know, I made it a point to talk to uh, uh, wait staff in restaurants and chambermaids in my right. hotels, not just the people I was seeing who tend to be better educated. And they were just uniformly appalled by who is this person who and, and who, people called him, you know, an idiot and whatnot. Next, um, we did not need to have 230,000 officially confirmed deaths. It's probably more on the order of 270,000. Uh, if we had uh, been as successful as South Korea, a very densely packed country we'd have fewer than 3,000 deaths. And right. So at DC Report, we hold Trump responsible basically for every death above South Korea's level. 
And they weren't the best. There are countries that have done better than they have. Malaysia, for example, if we were at their level, we'd have, I think, about 300 deaths. Um, Next, uh, all the things people haven't seen that the political termites, the people Trump appointed into political positions, but not requiring Senate approval, who have been just destroying our federal government, which, to be fair, Trump during the campaign said he was going to do. His language and that of Steve Bannon was, we're going to deconstruct the administrative state. Right. You know, that's fancy talk for we're going to destroy the U.S. government. So, you know, polluters have been set free. Records that were needed to prosecute people who commit crimes are gone or compromised. Um, we've documented all of that at DC Report uh, from the official record. You know, we only use name sources and government documents. And just last week, we started a four part series by me about what's happened at the IRS. Yeah. And it is perhaps the most shocking of all. There are 23,000 families in America that make over $10 million a year. Uh, Under Trump, the IRS audited seven of them. Not 70, not 700, not 7,000, seven of them. Unbelievable. Uh, Yeah. Uh, Barack Obama's rate was eight and a quarter percent um, Trump's audit rate for these folks is 0.03%. In other words, under Obama, 270 times higher audit rate. The working poor, 50 million households whose average income is only $12,600. Think about that. 50 million American households get by $1,000 a month. Their audit rate is nine times the audit rate of the super rich. And what about Criminal enforcement of the law. Well, normally we get about 2,700 proposed prosecutions by the IRS. Right. In the last 12 months, we had 231. Wow. So there's a 95% drop in proposed prosecutions. And of this tiny remaining number, Pete, just 231 cases, Bill Barr's Justice Department rejected more than 80% of them on two grounds insufficient evidence. Kind of hard to believe because the average case takes over a year to put together. Right. Or not a national priority. Oh. There are a total of 29 new cases accepted. That doesn't mean they're going to be prosecuted. Just accepted to see if they should prosecute in the 12 months that just ended uh, uh, September 30th. I mean, this is this is just a shocking breakdown. And it's it shows why, by the way. Many rich people, not all rich people, but many, many rich people, they just love Donald Trump because if you own your own, if you're an employee, if you're an executive who makes $50 million a year, you got to pay all your taxes. The system makes sure you pay your taxes. But if you're a business owner, and I've been a business owner, if you're an international business owner like Donald Trump, and especially if you're in the real estate business, your odds of getting caught are essentially zero. Your odds of being prosecuted are essentially zero. And we're going to do four parts explaining what's happened to this system. So you and I, you know, we get our taxes taken out of our paychecks, or in my case, pension checks, as well as my paycheck. And I, I have to pay all my taxes, like it or not, but not guys like Donald Trump. Yeah, well, actually, I'm new into being, you know, independent. Uh, you know, I'd worked for Sirius XM for 14 years. So now I what? am experiencing that. And uh, I... There's a lot to say about that, but I think in so much important work that you're doing, by the way, DCReport.org, check out this four-part series about how Trump gets uh, away without paying taxes, and more imp- also as important what you just said about the IRS being unable to audit, being unable to enforce uh, and, and, and conduct investigations. So I think the best question to ask someone like you about what we've lost how about what we've lost in terms of revenue into the federal government when yeah. President Trump cut taxes the, for yeah. the wealthy individuals and corporate interests with the Trump tax cuts? And obviously it builds a ma- major national debt and adds to uh, adds to the budget deficit. But in terms of that money not coming in, what have we lost in terms of not taking in revenue? Well, in the short run. The government is borrowing because of the pandemic, but we wouldn't be borrowing nearly as much because lots of corporations are still making very significant profits. Lots of people are making a lot of money. There's a huge imbalance that's come about in this country where we have millions of people who can't feed their kids and are on the verge of being evicted. 
but people at the top are making money hand over fist. Now, the smartest thing the new administration can do, assuming we get a new administration, is to put the corporate income tax rate and the individual rates back where they were for everybody who makes, I would argue, a million or more. Biden has said certainly 400,000 or more only. And then go to work finding the tax sheets. That's the easiest thing to do instead of raising rates higher. There's just enormous amounts of money out there. The IRS just announced the biggest tax fraud case ever, a $2 billion tax fraud. And the guy's partner is not going to jail because he ratted him out and he's paying $140 million in penalties and taxes. But, you know, it's a good it's a perfect example for my case, because the IRS didn't find this guy by auditing him. They found him because somebody ratted him out. Right. The previous biggest case in American history was a billionaire who reported sixty five thousand dollars a year of income, which was nonsense because he never reported the billions he made. And he got turned in by a mistress because he promised to buy her, her con- the condo she was living in. Then he, he broke the deal. And she turned him in and he went to prison. That's how they're catching people when they're forced to catch them because somebody reported them. Right. No, they need to be using standard law enforcement tools. And that's a huge loss, Pete. And it's really unfair to those of us who pay the amount that Congress says we need to pay. Very important. I'm so glad I had the opportunity to talk with you. I could talk with you hours more. I'll reach out to you again very soon. DCReport.org for all of David K. Johnston's work. He is the best. Thank you so much, sir. Take care, Pete. David K. Johnston. Don't forget the T. Follow him on Twitter at David C-A-Y-J. Go to DCReport.org. Get all of his books, which have been so influential in my thinking. I highly recommend all of his work. One of the best. So happy that he was available. Please give him a thank you on Twitter. And now joining me, one of my closest friends over the past several years, one of the all-time favorite guests on our show. He is a money manager. He's got his own firm, Ritholtz Wealth. He's also a big media star. He's got his own podcast. Podcast on Bloomberg called Masters in Business. He's got his own column there as well. You should subscribe to his daily reads. He's awesome on Twitter at Red Holtz. I wanted to ask him what we lost in terms of the economy, in terms of trust, maybe what he got wrong, and more. Here is the final guest of the special on what we lost during the last four years of Trump, the great Red Holtz at Red Holtz. I am recording, and there he is, at Red Holtz, Barry Red Holtz. Sir, thank you for joining me to talk about what in the world we have lost over the four, uh, the last four years. I remember talking to you when this all went down four years ago. How much do you think you had right? I think it was much worse than I expected. I was engaging in some wishful thinking and kind of hoping for the best, waiting waiting for that pivot towards being presidential and... Uh, it never, it never came. You did not predict a pandemic. I did not. Although well, I will tell you that my early read of this was going shopping with my sister out from the city um, late, late in February. And we, we were looking at various places for my mom and we stopped off at Target. I'm like, as long as you're out here, let's grab some, um, some goods. And, uh, Paper towels wiped out, toilet paper wiped out, any sort of sanitizing wipe gone. Clorox, it was just so weird. Like Long Island and much of suburbia freaks out every time it threatens to snow. You know, milk, juice, eggs gets wiped out. It's kind of bizarre how people behave that way. But this was like, you know, late February, but way early in the cycle. And because of this, we kind of. It gave us a little insight to give people the option of not coming into the office probably earlier than uh, than many other companies did. It was just, hey, this is a little funky. You could see something weird was going on. So in terms of the entire entirety of his presidency, how much has the economy changed and I think probably the last year is really the most important, right? Because the pandemic was the game changer that no one predicted. So, so first take a look at, uh, go to Fred, which is the St. Louis uh, federal reserve um, chart service. And you could punch in all sorts of charts, unemployment, GDP, retail sales, and just punch in like the 10 year time series. And you really can't see where Trump became president. GDP was going up, employment level was going up, unemployment level was going down. 
he basically inherited a robust economy and it continued under him. Um, the tax cuts that he passed, I prefer counter cyclical tax cuts and counter cyclical fiscal stimulus. You, in other words, in the middle of a recession, you you pass a big tax cut and spending plan like we did in uh, March of this year, April of this year, to make up for all the lost economic activity you get um, when the economy is contracting. Um, when he passed the tax cuts, it, it's called pro-cyclical, meaning the economy is all the way in the upswing, and now you're just going to pour fuel on the fire. Right, And it's, it's what you're supposed to do is when things are bad, government steps in for businesses and households. And when things are good, Government throttles back their spending, lets taxes creep up a little bit, balances the budget. Uh, instead, he just made the deficit appreciably worse. Now, I don't think the deficit is really a big deal. I think it's wildly um, overstated, but but meaning it, too much emphasis is put on something. As long as you have your own currency and your own central bank, you can fund deficits for as long as you want. We see that in Japan, and we're learning that in the United States, but hold that aside. Um, uh, the, the big problem with the economy isn't necessarily COVID, but it's our inability to wrestle it under control. And yeah, this is a global pandemic and it's expanding elsewhere, but there are countries that have done much better jobs than us. Uh, The first case in the United States and South Korea happened literally the same day. We're bigger than them. We're over 300 million. They're only like 60 or 70 million. But but we're coming up on a quarter million deaths and they had 400 deaths. It's it's just not proper. Just look to our north. Look at Canada. Canada's death rate is a fraction of America's death rate. It's like 40 something percent. It's much less than half. It, it, we're just not doing a good job. And the economy will not recover until we get the pandemic under control. So the economy is a second order effect of us bungling the health care issue. Let me get my Despicable Me dolls in the video. I, I kind of like them just kind of oh, I like on the shoulder. Yeah. I'm glad you turned the camera. Yeah, yeah. And so, you're sort of in a pink sauna? What's going on over that's there? That's right. That's the pink sauna studio. Right. That's actually right. the name of it. That's right. I dig it. So there was a relief bill that was passed that uh, was pretty well received in terms of economic analysts people said it worked it was well it was rolled out i'm sure there was all the cares kinds act. of the cares mm-hmm. act i'm sure there's all kinds of problems and, and and cronyism and corruption in terms of who got money and who didn't deserve money and so on but the fact is uh we're still in a bad situation and they did not pass another one and so aren't we going to see a lot of negative effects uh in the economy especially with folks who are the most vulnerable as a result of them not passing another bill and just leaving town a, a bill passed in the house nothing passed in the senate and the president uh was unable to get his party uh to to you know you had munchen were negotiating with pelosi but the issue was really mcconnell didn't matter what munchen did the senate wasn't on board and so the thought process is hey listen if we lose say pelosi and, and biden well, Trump will have to come back to the table and pass something. And if we win, well, then we'll pass whatever we want. So that seems to be the thinking. And I think Munchen and, and to a lesser third degree, time McConnell had the same idea. That's the third time he called uh, Mnuchin Munchen. Mnuchin. I call him Munchen. That's fine. I just want to make sure you knew that you're making the error. So, Munchen. Yeah, yes. I, I like it better. But But the other alternative is that... The Republicans maintain the Senate. They don't pass anything, and Americans just suffer, and so does the economy, and the, the new uh, Democrat president takes a real hit. So um, that's, that's, one, uh, that's one concern. I mean, the best scenario is a blue wave um, with a substantial majority in the Senate, and you act more like a parliamentarian um, uh, form of government where the new team comes in and they do what they want, or... Or the Senate and the House swing back to the Republicans and let them do it, let them have ownership of it. But someone should have ownership. This is the inherent problem with the American system. Once party and partisanship takes over for, you know, once it becomes country second, go back, look into the days of of Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan, look at throughout history, politics not only stopped at the shore, but anytime there was a recession, 
um, politics stopped. I mean, Mitch McConnell said the quiet part out loud during the Obama presidency. Our job is to stop him from getting anything true through even in the midst of a financial crisis. So McConnell is is not my favorite person. I, I don't think he helps um, uh, any of uh, Americans who have uh, have any sort of need that the government can help them fulfill from health care to you know, uh, unemployment insurance when you're in the midst of a, of a crisis. And we're already seeing the results of the cares act starting to fade. Right. So when, when you show, when you look through the various charts, when you look at retail sales, when you look at uh, GDP, when you look at it, everything is starting to plateau. And yes, this is the, one of the greatest quarters uh, statistically of GDP, But it follows one of the worst quarters statistically in GDP. And we now are all the way back up to about the bottom of the great financial crisis. That's that's how wonderful this quarter's GDP has been. Hey, great. We're back to as bad as it ever got during the great. All right. Final question. Name an industry or businesses that never come back. Uh, Who takes the worst? Who took the worst hit over the last four years, especially as a result of the pandemic? So so there's two answers to that. One answer is people are shocked whenever I show them this chart. Coal has been getting destroyed. It predates President Trump and everything he's tried to do to save coal has not helped. Coal is just in a permanent set downtrend, sort of like um, steam engines uh, at the turn of the last century. Coal <laughs> is just fading and fading. It's just a matter of time before coal mines are closed. No electrical plants will be burning coal. I don't know if that's 10 years or 25 years, but I don't think it's much beyond that. Um, and that has nothing to do with anything that Trump did. Um if you want to look at a sector that's been really demolished by what Trump did, then you have to look at the agriculture sector and the American farmer. He has demolished the American farmer because he basically played a game of chicken with China. And China said, um, OK, we're going to stop buying your farm products if you're right. not going right. to press us. Our farmers, and that's been a disaster. Farmers for lost farmer. access to markets. That's a huge loss. Giant soybean, pork go down the list. Bankruptcies in in um, middle of the country and in, in, of farmers have spiked. Suicides have spiked. The American farmer has really been hurt um, by the trade policies of this administration. And surprisingly, a high number of farmers who supported the president in 2016 are sticking with him this time. Right. Um, listen, some people you got to just keep beating over the head and they, you know, they they. They believe what they want to believe. And maybe, listen, I'm not running a farm. I I can't tell you what the best farm policy is. I could tell you that farmers are currently suffering due to this administration's policies. And um, we'll see what happens. I'm hoping that there will be a significant set of changes coming. Thank you for talking to me, Barry Redholtz. Anytime, man. The great ad, Red Holtz, on Twitter. Get his book, Bailout Nation. Listen to his podcast, Masters in Business. Awesome that he was able to join me on last second notice as well. Now, finally joining me is John Avalon of CNN. John and I have known each other a really long time. When I asked John to join me on this special, he said, sure, of course, as always, we found time to record it. And then John basically told me he really didn't want to do what I did with the rest of the guests here, he felt like he wanted to be in a positive place and he wanted really to have a discussion about how important our democracy was and it is and specifically how important the turnout is, has been in all of the early voting and here on Election Day. And so John and I had a little bit more positive discussion in terms of this day and what it meant. So a little bit of a departure from the previous discussions, but nonetheless, I will have any conversation that John wanted to have, and I was happy to have him on this special. So here it is right now, my discussion with John Avlon about how voting matters and how all of this turnout has been inspiring, if anything. Of course, follow follow John on Twitter at John Avlon. Watch him and his reality checks on CNN. Get all of his books. He's got a new book coming out about Lincoln. Here's my conversation with John Avlon. And John, always great when you get to join me. We're going to talk about the significance of this election and the massive turnout for this election and what it all means, right? 
Yeah, I, I just, these moments are important and they are fleeting. But after a period in which a lot of people have, have worried uh, about the fate of liberal democracy, not, not as, as an institution, not an action, because we live in a time when liberal democracy is under assault abroad. Mm-hmm. And we've seen democratic norms being broken at home. And it has been a challenging period. And we don't know the outcome, obviously. You and I are speaking, um, you know. Monday at. You know, the, the evening before Election Day. Right. But the turnout we're seeing alone, I think, speaks to, in a very hopeful way, uh, the deep persistence of our democracy, the vitality and vibrancy of our democracy. I don't for one second, you know, I'm not, not going to make predictions, nor am I going to, you know, I, I believe very much in the old first responders idea that you, you hope for the best and you prepare for the worst right. with regard to, you know, the, the divisions in our country and, and, and bad actors and bad faith, but on election day, but the sheer volume of turnout, the fact that, I mean, we've seen 93 people, 93 million people as of our count this morning, voting early in some form, that there are more people who voted early in Texas than voted in all of 2016. Right. And I think importantly, we now know, I think a little more clearly than perhaps we appreciated that 2016 was the lowest turnout in two decades. Right. And that is not unrelated um, to, to, to the, the cards we ended up being dealt. And I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but here's what I do know. If you have 600% increase in youth turnout in Texas, all the modeling is blown up, right? And, and it, it just, it, nobody, was gonna, nobody will have been modeling for 600% increase in youth vote in Texas. Now, it may or may not be determinative. It's Texas. I'm not suggesting it's all going one way. But the sheer defiant persistence of people voting early when the president was trying to reduce faith in democracy and 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 dismiss the idea of mail-in voting and so a lot of people showed up in person right uh is a remarkable thing to behold as we wait and i know waiting is the hardest part as tom petty used to say but th- there needs to be a degree of zen and very watchful eyes over the next 36 hours um, but that um, it is extraordinary just seeing the turnout and what it says about the spirit and the character of our country. What does, h- how do you determine based on this turnout, what has motivated them? I, and am I naive or an amateur political analyst to say that there are either, there are two reasons, inspiration, you're inspired by the moment and by the candidate, or you're scared, you're scared by the the, the the candidate and and the moment is there any way to read into that what is motivating such massive record turnout well we we, we have some data with regards to um and, and i've used it on reality check before with regards to um the the party registration of people who've requested ballots or handed in ballots early um and certainly by the way it, you know it's a 50 state process and early on it was a lopsided democrat and and um, Republicans seems to have closed the gap with early voting uh, over the last week or so, uh, perhaps not entirely. And again, it's different in every state. Uh, but but you're right. I mean, I think one of the struggles we face as a country, um, you know, I wrote a column in February of 19 about how Donald Trump was running for Richard Nixon's third term. And the reason I, I wrote it was is that he kept lifting phrases very apparently consciously. Hmm. By solid majorities in Nixon phrase, um, uh, and 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 law and order, the '68 campaign theme, which he's parroted, um, despite a demonstrated record of lawlessness that is perhaps unparalleled, um, um, and that more information is coming out every day, and is frankly getting lost in kind of the last couple of days of the election fray. Hmm. Um, but there'll be time for that one way or the other, right? Right. Um, you know it. Nixon said, you know, people, people vote out of, uh, fear, not love. They don't tell you that in Sunday school, but it's true. Right. And, um, I think that's one of the, the, the contests we have as a country. Um, certainly if you look at, at data about Joe Biden's support, um, it's around 50, 50 split 
I'm voting for Biden and against Donald Trump. I'd say Donald Trump's support is, and it is intense, and you need to recognize that and understand that. And and clearly, they're voting both for Donald Trump, but within a cocoon, with within a within a logic that is rooted in 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 negative partisanship, which you and I have talked a lot about. And I think one of the things we've seen in this era is how that um, that impulse, that quote unquote logic causes people to deny facts because you can always reach for an increasingly absurd extreme to justify whatever the person on your side has done. Um, but, but it does look, um, we know obviously (laughs) these folks are motivated whether by fear or by love. Um, and, um, and, and there's some indication, you know, really high turnout. If you look at, for example, let's just talk about data. If you look at 2012, uh, Obama's re-election, right. or 2004, Bush's re-election. The relative, or 96, 96 in particular, Bill Clinton, um, which is the one where the pre-election polling looks most similar. Um, relatively low turnout elections. That's not good, by the way. I like high turnout elections. Um, it's notable to have a president's re-election be accompanied by very high uh, turnout. And, and, you know, I, I did my reality check this morning on uh, Donald Trump and <clears throat> the question of whether his supporters are in fact, as he has said, a, a silent majority or a loud minority. And I think it's one of the questions we'll know the answer to at hmm. the end of tomorrow. But I made the point that Trump has never been a majority president. Right. Uh, he wasn't elected with the majority. He's never governed as a majoritarian president. He's never been above 50% in approval. The only president in the history of the Gallup poll ever to be, a, never to be above 50% Is that approval. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. This is one of the reasons I thought he was, he was, he, he was very vulnerable before COVID hit and it was not a popular position because I think frankly, a lot of people have been kind of self-protective, but if you just looked at the data, I mean, his strong support number and his strong approval, uh, his strong disapproval number are, are basically two to one against him. That wasn't the case with the incumbent when it was Bush, Clinton, Obama. No, and, and I do think in, in the in the uh, well, and, and the other no, um, and th- there are other differences too. Remember, I mean, the lack of a third party candidate um, should uh, benefit um, Biden. I mean, one of my favorite statistics is, as you've heard me yammer about in the past, that uh, that Ralph Nader got ninety eight thousand votes in Florida in two thousand, and Bush won by five hundred and thirty seven. Right. Yeah, it's so I because mean, all those Ralph Nader voters didn't think Donald didn't think Al Gore was good enough on the environment. There is a third party, technically, you're saying, but nobody's really paying attention. Uh, well, the, the Libertarian candidate more more likely to come out of the out of the Republicans' hide, um, so to speak. Um, but you know, it it it, it the, with the point I want I made in the reality check I, because I don't want to sound too sort of eve of election day zen <clears throat> when people who do this for a living kind of feel like you know the die is cast and we need to see where it lands and you can see certain trends but nobody knows nobody knows until the votes comes in that's just that's just the reality of how these things work you can look at how the modeling and the polling is <clears throat> dramatically different than it was this time four years ago and you can gain hope or despair for that but the one thing that i i talked about this morning is what we haven't seen in the absence of trying, we've never seen a, 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 an incumbent president really not try to win the popular vote, which is the first <laughs> big tell about the anti-majoritarian impulse. And the second thing we've never seen is um, a, 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 strat, a core strategy of voter suppression Right. Um, that we have seen uh, the Republicans implement, try to implement uh, for weeks now, and I recommend Ben Ginsburg's op-eds, one today and one three weeks ago about okay. this. And he was the former lead Republican um, election lawyer. And he's just saying, look, voter fraud is a myth. It's a myth designed to justify mass voter fraud is a myth. That's an important qualifier. And it's, 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 it's a myth ginned up to justify voter suppression. We need to call it out what it is. Yeah. Um, and then, um, you know, the president and his team are Bloating various scenarios about will he declare victory, and you know, w- without having won, and 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 you know, I don't want to minimize the danger of a president who seems to have voter suppression as a core strategy, but not winning a majority of votes. That's a that's a dangerous situation, and we're going to have to 
we're going to have to have a doc of democracy movement in this country that goes on well beyond election day. We're going to have a lot of time to talk about that. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to that conversation and every next conversation I get to have with you. And John Avalon, as always, I really appreciate you being available and chatting with me. It's really interesting. My friend, your thoughts. We've been through a lot together and uh, we will go through. More. We will be going through a lot more together, no matter what. Thanks, pal. Be well, my friend. All right. That is it. Thank you so much to all of my guests. What a kick ass lineup and I could not do it without your support if you're not a subscriber please sign up now because that is what you get on this show Dr. Ruth ben Giat, John Avalon, Katie Fang, Jared Yates Sexton, David K. Johnson, Dr. Michael Mann, Barry Erdholtz, Wajad Ali and Glenn Kirshner an all star lineup answering the question what have we lost from 2016 to 2020 and this is the one year anniversary of this podcast so certainly We've gained that. we built an amazing community here as well. I'd love to see you on the Discord chat. I'd love to see you tonight during our Hangout. If you're not already a subscriber, sign up now. And thank you so much for your support. You're never alone when you're part of the Stand Up with Pete Dominic community. I'll talk to you later.